In this video, we will discuss our very first transformation. We will use it as an opportunity to introduce some terminology and to pose some very new and very intriguing questions. And the way this and all other discussions of transformations will go is by specifying the transformation first. And to specify a transformation, I have to give you a rule for where each vector goes under the transformation. So our first example will of course come from the space of geometric vectors. Geometric vectors is our go-to vector space for inspiration and for intuition. So it's not at all surprising that our first few examples will come from this space. And actually much of the terminology, of course, is inspired by geometry. So our very first transformation will be reflection with respect to a straight line that passes through the origin, passes through the tip of the zero vector. So it will be denoted by the letter R. And here's the rule for reflection. Any vector, if you want to discover where it goes under this transformation, you have to draw a line perpendicular to the straight line through the tip of the vector and go as far on the other side of the line as the tip of the vector on this side. You mark that point and that's the tip of this vector reflected. So if this vector is u, then this vector is denoted by r of u. Notice that there are usually no parentheses. So you can put r parentheses u, but we're by now inspired by the matrix notation. And when we use matrices, we don't put parentheses. It, we're trying to make this look like matrix multiplication, because indeed we will soon think of multiplication by a matrix as a transformation in Rn. So this notation borrows from Rn. Typically, when you're talking about functions, you would put parentheses around the argument. But if we can avoid it, we won't put the parentheses around the argument. That comes from matrices. All right, let's consider one more example. How about this vector? We'll call this vector v. And then r of v is right here. r of v. OK, how about one more example? How about I will use this vector right here, lies along the line, and it's, we'll call it the vector w. OK, and to reflect the vector w, you have to pursue the same strategy, or I should say recipe, which is draw a line perpendicular to the straight line that passes through the tip of the vector go as far on the other side as the vector on this side. And of course, that's going to zero distance, so we're right here. And that's the vector RW. And it's the same as W, so RW. And let's just write what we just realized, that it's the same as W. So this vector stays itself, remains itself, under the transformation. Now, a couple new terms. The, this vector, the result of a linear transformation is called the image. It is the image of this vector. And this vector is called the pre-image of this one. And you can see how this terminology comes from real life. This is compared to looking in the mirror and seeing your reflection. So that's your image. If this is you, then your reflection in the mirror appears here. So you're looking at your image. So the term image that applies to all transformations, not just in linear algebra, but in broader applied mathematics, comes from geometry, from almost physics, our physical experience with mirrors, actually more specifically from this transformation, from reflection, so that's kind of nice. So this is image, I won't write it on the board because you're hearing it, and this is the pre-image. Okay, that's, that's fundamental terminology. Okay. Now, the next big question is, is this transformation linear? And for that, we have to think back to the breakfast example of converting euros into dollars, where it didn't matter 
whether you added up the euro amounts first and then translated the total into dollars, or whether you converted the individual amounts and then added up the dollar amounts. The result was the same in both cases. And to carry that way of thinking over to this example, we have to pose the following question. Does it matter whether we take two vectors first, add them together, and then reflect the result, or whether we reflect the individual vectors and then add up the images? If the order doesn't matter, and then the same test for multiplication by a scalar, if the order doesn't matter, then the transformation is linear. So I don't think I actually will draw the sum, but I don't really think we need to do it. I think it's actually a little bit of a distraction. I think you can do this whole way of thinking in your mind. But here's the picture that you should have in your mind. So let's add the two vectors first by the parallelogram rule. Okay, so then this would be their sum. This would be u plus v. And now let's reflect u plus v. And the way that's done, I'm now going to go to a different color so it doesn't become too messy, is by reflecting according to the specified rule, interfering with these letters, but that's okay. And I think we're going to end up Take this distance, move it over here, right here. What an unfortunate location. Okay, so this vector right here, let's draw it in yellow, will be R, and now we do need parentheses because we have a sum R of U plus V. And the question is, would we have gotten the same vector if we added up the images, if we added up the reflected vectors? And the answer is, well, I tried to aim as best I could and I missed it a little bit, but yes, you see that it's the same vector. So it doesn't matter whether you add them up first and then reflect the sum or whether you reflect the individual vectors and then add up the reflections. In, the, in both cases, you end up with this vector. So we think that linearity is in the cards. There's that one additional test. Linearity means two things. Sum is one, but multiplication by a scalar is the other. And it's just as easy to make sure that that rule is satisfied as well. So if we took this vector and multiplied it, let's say, by two, and then reflected it, we would be right here. Alternatively, we can reflect this vector first and then multiply the reflection by two, and we're right there at the same spot. So there are basically two worlds here. One world is on this side of the mirror, and then the reflected world looks exactly the same, except reversed in some sense. Right? So whatever happens here is kind of replicated here. And that's basically the source of the linearity, except the difference between this and the physical example with the mirror is that here the vectors go both ways. So in all of my examples, I pick vectors in this semiplane, but I could have picked vectors in this semiplane and even mixed them together when we were considering the sum. Of course, it goes every which way and it doesn't matter. Okay, so yes, we're dealing here with a linear transformation. And now we will ask perhaps the most unexpected question that will seem whimsical at first, but will prove to be one of the most important questions that you can ask about a linear transformation. The question is this, can you identify the vectors that remain parallel to themselves under this transformation? So parallel is not broad enough as it turns out. So let me define parallel in algebraic terms. We're looking for vectors whose image is a scalar multiple of the pre-image. So this here is the sort of vector we're looking for. We're looking for a vector Let's say, well, might as well use V, a vector whose image under the reflection is a multiple. And there is a preferred letter that mathematicians use for that multiple. And that letter is the Greek letter lambda. And it here stands for a scalar. So we're looking for a vector whose image is a multiple 
of the original vector. So in algebraic terms, the sort of vectors we're looking for satisfy this algebraic rule. This is better than saying parallel to itself, parallel to the pre-image, because when lambda is zero, in other words, when some vector under this transformation becomes the zero vector, it certainly satisfies this relationship because you can choose lambda equals zero. That's why writing down the algebraic expression is better than saying that the image is parallel or points along the same line, would be another way of saying, as the pre-image. So this question truly seems whimsical and irrelevant, and it's somewhat surprising that it ends up being the most crucial question you can ask about a linear transformation and identifying these special vectors and the special numbers that goes with those vectors is one of the most important things you can do in analyzing a linear transformation. So let me tell you what these vectors and the corresponding numbers are called. These are not the most mellifluous sounding words, but you'll get used to them and they'll seem very natural to you. So the vector is called an eigenvector. The word eigen has German etymology. It means self or proper. And the corresponding number is called the eigenvalue. Okay, there are other synonyms for these terms. For example, proper vector and proper value, and a few more, but the terms that we'll use is eigenvector and eigenvalue. And when the linear transformation is specified in geometric terms, as it is here, we'll be able to identify the eigenvalues and eigenvectors by insight. And of course, that brings up a very interesting question. If these are so important and we're not able to identify them by sight, then what do we do? And of course, as in the case of linear systems, there is a robust technique in linear algebra for identifying eigenvalues and eigenvectors for any transformation. It will be a very big and important discussion, especially on how to convert a geometric problem to a problem that you can do on the computer. That will be one of the pivotal moments in our linear algebra course. Okay. But for this simple linear transformation, we can, def we can identify these vectors rather easily. So you should probably take a moment and try to identify those vectors, pause the video, and then come back and see if your answer is correct. All right, but the first one is staring right at you. And of course, it's this one that lies on the line. And you can see how this equation looks very similar to this one, where lambda equals one. So this vector is indeed an eigenvector and the corresponding eigenvalue is one. And actually any vector whose tip lies along this line is an eigenvector with one corresponding to the eigenvalue. So as, it, as will always be the case, it's not just a single vector, it's an entire eigenspace of vectors. And in this case, that eigenspace is any vector that lies along this line. So this should remind you of the null space a little bit, where if you found an element in the null space, any multiple of that element was in the null space as well. So it wasn't just a null vector, it was a null space. And there we would write down alpha times that vector. The tradition in discussions for, on eigenvalues and eigenvectors is a little bit different. Yes it's, an, it, yes, it's an entire space. You can call it an eigenspace. But if somebody asks you for eigenvectors, you just pick one representative vector from that entire space, and you write it down, and you say, that's the eigenvector. And of course, you're implying that any multiple of that vector is an eigenvector as well. That's understood. So the tradition is to pick one and to write it down. So here is our eigenvector and the corresponding eigenvalue is one. And just to note, if that eigenspace was two-dimensional, you would simply write down two vectors. And n-dimensional, you would write down a basis for that space. Any n vectors you choose that represent the basis is a good solution to that question, to that problem. Okay, so here is one. Is there another that's altogether different from this one? 
So if you search with your eyes for quite a while, or maybe not so long, you will be able to find that vector. And that vector is one that's orthogonal to the straight line. We're running out of letters, so let's call this vector O, because it's orthogonal, O. So let's find the image of this vector. And the rule is, draw a line orthogonal to the line through the tip of the vector, so that line coincides with the vector itself, cross the line, go the same distance to the other side, and that's the image of the vector. So this is R O. Okay, and what's the relationship between O and R O? We can write it down right here. Let me see, maybe there's enough space. Uh, there really isn't, so I'll write it right here. R applied to O is, of course, opposite of O, negative O. And does this relationship fit this pattern? Yes, it does, where lambda equals minus 1. And of course, once again, any multiple of the vector O would also satisfy this equation, this relationship with lambda equals minus 1. So any one of those, including ones on this side of the line, can be considered eigenvectors. So we just choose one. I chose this one. Okay, and the corresponding eigenvalue is negative 1. And there isn't another one. Any other one certainly changes, as we see from all of these examples, changes the direction or the lie, the line it lies on under reflection. So reflection with respect to a line has two eigenvalues, zero, excuse me, one and minus one, and two corresponding eigenvectors. Let me ask you one more question that I think you'll find very intriguing. So the two eigenvalues associated with this transformation are one and negative one. I will now show you an algebraic equation related to this transformation whose roots are, as if by magic, one and negative one. And that will be a very nice mystery to be solved a little bit later. So ask yourself the following question. What is the transformation that's equivalent to two successive reflections? In other words, take a vector, reflect it, and then reflect its image. So two successive reflections. Consider that our new transformation. And of course, you will get the original vector back. Let's take a look. Start with this vector, reflect it, then use this vector as our starting point and reflect it again. And of course, you're right back here. So successive reflections, two successive reflections amounts to nothing. The word for nothing in linear algebra comes once again from matrix notation and you use it the identity, the identity transformation. So let's write it down in algebraic terms. So two successive reflections can be written as R of R of V. So let me start here. It can be written as R applied to R of V. So you can put parentheses if you would like, but the tradition, like I said before, is to not use parentheses, which can be written as R squared of V, which is V itself. That's the property of this combined transformation that we have just discovered. So if we were to drop the vector itself and just write an identity in transformations alone, which is sexy, you would write something along the lines of R squared equals identity. Right? That's an even better way of saying neither because there's no argument, which is arbitrary because it applies to all vectors, that transfer that reflection squared equals identity. Twice, reflecting something twice amounts to doing nothing. Which, of course, reminds us of this algebraic equation. Now, if you think of this, ref this transformation as the, un the unknown, a corresponding equation, and I'm just, you know, using my algebraic inspiration here. I'm looking at something like this and say, yes, it's an identity we just discovered, but let's treat it as an equation. And then the equation would be x squared, or if we think that this is the unknown, equals 1. And what are the roots of the equation x squared equals 1? 1 and negative 1. 
just like the eigenvalues of this transformation. Is it a coincidence? Not at all, as we'll discover in not so distant future.